Ladies and gentlemen, it's another episode of Prototype. And on this episode, I, Pronogo, game designer, RTS man, am going to talk to you about some things that have happened in the last week or so. That includes the addition of many more units to the Zerg roster. Of course, my conversation with The Electric Underground, now available over on the No Frauds Club YouTube channel. My future conversations with other YouTubers, a preview of our forthcoming Cosmonarchy tournament on the weekend, and, of course, some coffee questions. Actually, we have a lot of coffee questions. We have five of them, and a lot of them are going to take a while to get through, so don't be surprised if this ends up being like a half and half or maybe even more coffee time than non-coffee time. Of course, if you want to get in on that coffee time, you can join us. Join the movement that is bringing the future of the real-time strategy genre to the forefront. Join us on the coffee link in the description, and you too can ask us questions that I and many others will eventually be engaging with. Without further ado, it's probably a good idea to start this conversation off talking about another conversation that happened. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about how the Electric Underground's conversation with me went. Mark from that YouTube channel. I was tempted to say, oh, hi, Mark, but I decided against it because uh, honestly, I probably would have done it except like at work, my part time. Somebody did that and I realized how annoying it must be to constantly hear that if your name is Mark. And I've already kind of like psychologically tormented a person named Mark. So I didn't really want to do that again since I'm no longer like a angsty teenager. I figure I've probably grown since then. So anyway, uh, that aside, Mark from the Electric Underground did indeed say hi. And we did have a almost three hour long conversation. Actually, it was almost four hours all told when we factor in the stuff that we talked about before and the stuff that we talked about after. Uh, and anyway, he's a really cool guy. He even offered to, uh, well, I, I proposed the idea, but he agreed to it, to test out our tutorial uh, for Cosmonarchy, our tutorial work, when it's a little bit more complete and ideally when the installation process is a lot more smoothed out. But let's suffice it to say that that conversation was really cool. In some ways, he basically showed me a more developed genre and talked about how, you know, like illustrated how some design principles or maybe even theories that I hold that I think are worth exploring at the very least have been explored and what those results were, you know, within other genres and how maybe you could take those experiences and then transmute them over into the RTS genre. It was a very elucidating conversation and I'm glad that we had it. Uh, of course, the, the main focus of that conversation was difficulty and, and I guess like player expression with choice and stuff and how uh, actually having more limitations often leads to better expression, actually, because, you know, you, you want to have that difference between a new player and an experienced player, a, a low skill player and a high skill player. You want to have a lot of value that the player can sort of, I guess, create themselves based on their own predilection. And so, yes, of course, you want to support multiple play styles. You want to support different ways of expressing a player, uh, a player's own like tendencies and stuff. But you want to do that through a robust choice, you know, robust set of tools, perhaps, uh, in terms of like a feature set or a sandbox being wide and expansive. Uh, but you also want to make sure that there's limits, there's opportunity costs, so that you can't simply amalgamate all of those choices into one meta sort of solution where you take the best from this part and the best from that part, and there's no real cost to combining them. Uh, so the concrete examples were, you know, taking uh, pushing a button and switching all of your bio units to mech or whatever, which is really crazy to think about in an RTS context, but it's kind of what you can do in things like the uh, Devil May Cry uh, style switchers in DMC 3 and 4. Uh, so that is an example that Mark gave in the conversation, and he likened it to being able to just transform all of your uh, mech stuff into bio or vice versa. Uh, so uh, as a, a Terran player fighting, you know, against Zerg or Protoss. And so that's just one example where it's like, oh, okay, yeah, I can kind of see what you're talking about. If, if you could do something tantamount to that, even just being able to switch all of your production over like that with not really much of a cost would be a huge advantage, a huge boon. And it would definitely uh, trivialize and, I guess, take the essence out of the decision to go down a bio build or mech build first in the first place. So I think that was like an interesting way to think about certain problems when it comes to play styles and, and having tools and stuff. And obviously we like the idea of having a lot of tools in Cosmonarchy, but, you know, an opportunity cost and like, is that enough of an opportunity cost is an 
ongoing conversation dialogue with our players and with uh, the games that are being played in many ways. So definitely something that we're keeping good tabs on. And I feel like we've established a reasonable baseline play. You know, it's just a question of, are we going to see some game breaking, met, you know, meta defining uh, changes that come out of player strategies or whatever, like <clears throat> Jack Yelansky with his D-Gen Zerg that Nablaim has picked up and stuff like that. Are we going to see that open up as like a really common opener or what exactly is going to happen? So it's definitely cool. I'm really happy to see uh, those changes and stuff, but I am also very interested in tracking that. I'm also obviously interested in tracking difficulty. Uh, the fact that you ha have an arcade style set of genre, like uh, shooting games, right? Uh, little STGs, shoot 'em ups that the electric, uh, the electric underground channel overall like focuses on. He also likes fighting games, like literally fighting games, you know, just like beat em ups or whatever and uh, tech end and stuff like that. So you know, he's, he's coming at it from a very different angle, but a lot of the times there's like some competitive content, maybe in fighting games especially, but most of it is going to be single player, maybe some co-op, like, you know, local stuff, but most of the time it's single player. And so you have to be thinking about it from that perspective. The difficulty becomes the content because then the difficulty itself is sort of like forcing you to play the game and master the game more in order to progress or in order to get a high score or whatever. And I'm not, I, I usually think of score as like an extrinsic thing instead of an intrinsic thing, but I think he's kind of adopted it into his nomenclature. And we'll probably talk more about that when we inevitably talk again, because the conversation was really good and I definitely want to get him back on or, you know, maybe join his podcast if he still does his and stuff like that. So definitely a situation where we're, you know, two peas in a pod in many respects. And I really like the back and forth and stuff. So I was a big fan. I was a big fan. Um, and broadly speaking, I would say looking at the way that the conversation went, I think a lot of other people thought that, uh, we were able to, you know, hit it off with each other and talk a lot and stuff like that. And so, you know, some people were critical of the length. Some people were, um, maybe critical of the ideas expressed, like the whole story thing obviously rubs people the wrong way. Cause that was another focus of the conversation was story itself is like always supposed to be secondary to gameplay. And I was thinking that like, well, I would like the story to be good. And I think presenting a story is really different in a game than it is in a, a book or whatever. And I have some novel ideas for how to make it so that you kind of account for the fact that it's being played and replayed again and again. And so, you know, some of that stuff I feel like is important to think about. Uh, and, and, you know, like, I think you can reclaim territory that we've seeded conceptually if we're hardcore gamers by, uh, you know, on an average, the hardcore gamer is thinking to himself, I don't care about any story. I want to skip all cutscenes, that sort of stuff. I think it's probably possible to convince somebody like, you know, hey, give it a chance, see what it's like, and then do a good job with it. Uh, and, and for it to actually elevate the experience, even if you think to yourself, no, I just want to be playing and pushing buttons all the time. Like, no, actually the, the downtime can be really good if the density of the experience within the actual game is like such that you, you want there to be a push and a pull, you know, a, a midpoint and a high point at the end. And then sort of like the come down and then, okay, you got time to breathe now. And let's like maybe have a, a short dialogue snippet. Let's have a briefing for the next mission. Let's have all this stuff that kind of frames it and, and nicely sets it up. And I feel like that kind of thing can be really big. Like, I guess what I'm getting at is I wouldn't really want to be putting the design or writing or whatever you want to call it of a project in the position of including elements that you expect will be skipped. Because if you're going to do that, then you need to find some way to like basically make those elements kind of redundant or just like a little bit of extra, but obviously surplus to requirements because you're basically saying, hey, uh, you know, players are going to skip the cutscene, so I shouldn't include the cutscene then, right? Like that would be the logical conclusion for me. Why include a cutscene if you're planning for it to be skipped? But at the same time, like if you're replaying it, that's a little bit different. And I think maybe making it more interesting or compelling on replay, more suitable to the idea that you are replaying it is probably the better action. And so we talked a little bit about stuff like that. And so definitely check that conversation out. There will be a link in the description for you to enjoy. Uh, and yeah, I guess the uh, there's another thing that I should briefly point out before we move on to the next major topic. Uh, so I have been making plans to do interviews for a long time with people, and we just haven't really made it happen. However, I am going to be recording a conversation with Saiyan SC or Saiyan KCM on YouTube. He is a caster and like brood war type character. And he's, we're going to just be talking a lot about brood war specifically. So if you like those more concrete examples where we talk about brood war, he's probably not going to be very familiar with our work. You know, I don't think he knows much about cosmonarchy or even that he knows that it is a thing that it exists, but I would love to have a conversation with him specifically about, you know, things that he thinks brood war does well, 
areas where he believes brood war can be improved. And I'll probably like break down specifically like, Hey, you know, do you even think the brood war is the greatest RTS? What do you think is great about it? Uh, and maybe we'll probably talk a little bit about Starcraft too, and try to be a little bit more on the analytical side of like, you know, here's why it didn't live up to brood war as opposed to just ba bashing on it, which I feel like I'm not sure that he's done. I don't think he's, he said he's not done any podcasts before, so that'll be interesting. But, uh, I think a lot of brood war heads have a tendency to do that. And then they dismiss anything that isn't brood war, uh, or they always Im imagine that brood war can never be surpassed or whatever. And so I'll be testing some of these hypotheses with him and see how he feels where he comes down on those issues. That'll be one of the things. And I think I'm just going to poke around and see if I can find any other, you know, brood war heads and maybe some people that are tangentially linked to even like uh, Mark at the electric underground or such communities and see what we can uh, bang out in that respect. Because I just think having, you know, in the past, I was always going for people who I was kind of familiar with and kind of new. And now I'm like, okay, well, I don't actually, like I've maybe watched a couple of videos from the Electric Underground and from San and, and stuff like that. So I kind of, I know, I certainly know of them. Like if somebody said their username, I would definitely recognize it. But I don't deeply know them. I haven't studied like a million interviews and I haven't like watched a million podcasts of these people. So I think going out of my own sort of preparatory com comfort zone in terms of preparation is going to be cool. And, you know, talking to other YouTubers, doing those kinds of collaborations or whatever, I think is kind of neat. And so, you know, some of them are going to be very much RTS related. Some of them will be a bit more general gaming related, like what uh, Marx was with the Electric Underground uh, conversation. So definitely keep your eyes peeled for that. And hey, if you know any other StarCraft YouTubers that you think would make for good interview guests, you can put them in the description and I'll see if I can make a contact to them. There's obviously some people like, you know, it'd be great to talk to like Artosis and Tasteless. It'd be great to talk to Day9. It'd be great to talk to Uthermal. It'd be great to talk to all sorts of stuff and uh, all sorts of people. And so, you know, those are the big names, but if you know any smaller names than that or any names that are also big, but maybe a bit more receptive to that idea, definitely uh, try to put us in touch, try to connect us. Actually, the, the the Electric Underground's interview only happened because of Nopi on our Discord server putting Mark and I into mutual con contact. So that was really cool. And so if you want to make something like that happen, then definitely uh, make sure to, to post that or, or, you know, at me on Discord or leave a comment on this video or whatever, and we'll see what we can get done. And that is pretty much that. All right, it's finally time to talk about the elephant in the room and the giant space crab in the room and the whatever the hell that thing is on the right. We have three more units for the Zerg arsenal. And we've also, I, I didn't really talk a little bit about this at all in the lead up to March Invitational A, and we actually never saw it in that event, but I should have mentioned that the Vilgoricor now mutates into the Istrathaleth, and the Vilgoricor itself re received a pretty heavy revision leading up to that event. And so you should definitely keep your eyes peeled for that in the future for Cosmonarchy, because Anyway, that unit is really cool in the Astrathaleth, aka Defiler, coming back into maybe a little bit more focused play because it's more accessible since you'll probably have a nest if you're hitting tier three. And then you can update that into the Anter and then you can upgrade your Vilgora cores and, and so on and so forth. So anyway, I figured I'd point that out just a little bit. You know, there, this is the point where ideally you'd actually see the Astrathaleth graphic somewhere on the, in the screen, but I promise you it's not hidden there at all. Uh, I only now thought about pointing that out. But hey, we have these three units. They're not particularly uh, photogenic, particularly the one on the right. I mean, you can kind of almost believe without, if you just look at it in passing, that maybe the middle and left guy are on the same, sort of like from the same game or whatever. And maybe they're a little bit reasonable, uh, but in practice, actually, when you look at them, that disappears pretty quickly. And then the thing on the right is just like an eyesore, but hey, uh, it is in the game. It does function, and we do need uh, to eventually replace it. Maybe I'll even look for a replacement graphic in Five Nations or something, because that graphic is just not ideal. But uh, anyway, despite its not idealness, we do have those units implemented. It's very cool, very exciting. Uh, currently, I actually am struggling to uh, restore some Photoshop actions that allowed me to batch action things like building shadows, and that's why the chasel itself, which is pictured a little bit out of frame in the top there, uh, I guess mostly out of frame, has an incorrect shadow. So now that I've pointed that out, if you didn't notice it before, you will now. Uh, you're welcome. I just can't let it go un untalked about. Uh, but hey, it's cool. We got that out there, and... Uh, the fact that with the Zerg are getting their roster additions and kind of like filling out in that respect, uh, and these are all tier three units, I should mention, uh, it's it's going to be pretty slick, I think. And, um, you know, this means that they're one unit away from what will eventually be their cap of units, which is 46. Uh, the only way that they would get more units is if I added more mutations at the end stage, which would be things like, 
you know, the, the Gazithalor turns into the Alcagelisk. So if the Cascathalor turned into the Cathrostalor like we originally planned, and then I added mutations for the Excitralisk and the Mortothricor, that would be three more units in total. Uh, so the Zorbrialisk is the only one that's outstanding right now uh, for the mutation of the Lachizalisk. And so anyway, going through all that, means that we are one unit away from the current planned units list, crucially not the building list, because the Kazitrith Cesian still needs to be made. Uh, and the Agrileth I'd probably like to add at some point, but that's like a hybrid. Uh, anyway, the um, from what's on the website right now, the there's only one more unit that needs to be added and one more structure that needs to be added, and then we are golden as far as those plans go. And maybe I might fit in some more units at the tail end of things. Uh, that being said, that would still iron us out for you know, 46 units in the tech tree for Zerg, which is the highest they've ever had for sure. Uh, the other races are going to be around uh, 49 to 52 by my last calculations. I think uh, Terran will be at 53 if I actually get the hypnagogue working, which I kind of, I was in the middle of tracking down why it wasn't working. And I actually hooked something that eventually gave us the access to the, um, the, the amazing change where you play the aggressive sound when you attack move since that wasn't happening before. Uh, so that's really great to, that we got that implemented. But uh, beyond that, uh, getting the Hypnagogue in is obviously a pretty big deal at some point for the Terrans, because that's the only unit that they've got planned that isn't done. Then it would just be the Ten Sender for their buildings. And then I'd have to think, do I want to add anything else to the Terran tech tree that, you know, will eventually give us some more advantages or more power or whatever? Uh, on the Protoss side, uh, the they have three more units that need to be added, the Mainstay, Acilliant, and Vibrance. And then obviously we'd be moving things like probably the Architect over to the Unitary Union and buffing it. Um, the Unitary Union being the structure that trains the three aforementioned units. And that would leave the Arden Authority with four units that it makes, the Unitary Union with four units that it makes. Although there was also thoughts that maybe I would end up moving the Clarion up there uh, to the Unitary Union as well, off of the Synod so that, you know, you have a little bit more tech disparity. Since the Clarion doesn't really feel like a unit that would share, you know, rub shoulders with the Empress and the Demiurge, it's a kind of like a smorgasbord, whatever, like cheese board, I guess, of whatever you're, you're going to have out of the Synod. It's not very, I guess, thematically consistent or coherent. Uh, meanwhile, there's the Xenolith, which is a structure that has never been implemented because its concept is kind of out of date. Um, it's actually supposed to be a replacement to the Crucible when the Crucible was essentially the uh, town center still, uh, the, the town depot, the return depot. So uh, that's obviously gone, but maybe the Xenolith can then serve a different purpose. Uh, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, it's supposed to be a tier three pylon type. Uh, so what would it do that the Crucible doesn't already currently do? Not sure. I'd have to think about that, but uh, definitely something to think about. So anyway, that does mean that we're nearing the conclusion of all of the uh, fi you know the uh, units that just never got implemented or whatever. Uh, I am looking forward to seeing what else we can come up with for different purposes. For uh, you know, like the Zerbrialis might need a revi revision to its plan behavior because it was supposed to be able to move while borrowed and that is tech that we just don't have currently but despite that it's still like pretty slick and so anyway the Trebrothalor is an artillery unit that's the guy on the left he has crushing tide so he can attack up to three targets and each one of those attacks can bounce and he launches four attacks so technically he's attacking uh, up to well he's attacking up to four targets uh obviously or sorry up to three targets uh four times each right? So he's firing 12 shots max, and then those can bounce once. So he's technically possible, it's possible for him to deal, uh, what is that, tw 24 hits of his damage, which is pretty insane if you can get all of that done. And it's an artillery unit, so odds are you can get all of that done. And so you're talking about 24 uh, times 8, by the way. And so if anybody wants the quick maths on that, it's 192 possible damage. Uh, that's assuming you aren't running into any armor, because he doesn't have any armor pen. Uh, but, you know, it's still pretty slick. And so that unit might need some tuning as a result of that. Currently, it can attack both ground and air. I wasn't sure if I wanted to make it able to attack air, but it is a tier, it's an end game unit and a tier 3 unit. So I figured maybe that would be fine. Uh, it does have 4 armor itself, which might need to drop. It has 180 health, which actually isn't that much. And it's a mutation of the Kagralisk. So keep all of that in mind. Going over to the Acrimnalisk, which is the big bad boy in the middle. Uh, that This guy has got almost 400 life, 380 to be exact. Five armor, pretty slick stuff there. Very expensive. Uh, well, maybe marginally expensive considering its stats. Uh, and the, the big thing that it does is it has the old Madrigal passive where it would fire shot, or not passive, but deployment mode, where it would fire shots at everything with no delay, no stagger. Uh, that's what it's got for Omnispores, its secondary weapon. Uh, and it just, it doesn't need to deploy for that. Uh, and it can also use its primary weapon while moving, which is similar to the Avigralisk, which is the source for this 
this mutation, this monstrosity. Uh, when you move the Evigralisk, it can attack up to four targets, and if it's stationary, it just attacks the same target four times. Well, the Acriminalisk dispenses with the disparity there, and it can just simply attack while moving, but it happens to be very slow, very lumbering. It's the ultimate base buster, you can kind of think of it as. Now, its primary attack can only attack ground units, but its Omnispores can attack ground and air. And so it's not going to be super good versus air exactly, but it will probably end up working out pretty well overall. And, um, you know, I, I would say it's like, you know, you, you can get it focused down, obviously, in the, in the later stages of the game. I'm not really sure about how the balance is going to shake up, but thankfully, the fact that these guys are tier three means you kind of need to get to a point where a lot of very powerful tools are available before you can use these guys. So is it really going to be a problem if you have more, even more, uh, well, I guess I would say additional powerful tools? Probably not. That's my thinking anyway. And moving on to the last, but certainly not least, the Al Gaztalisk. Actually, uh, Discord member Fuck the King, which is a great username, uh, was constantly talking about the Al Gaztalisk, actually. I say constantly, like once, at least two or three times a week, he would mention that he really wants to see the Algoztalisk for the, you know, Zerg machine gun or whatever, because I told him it's like basically as fast as the Calculisk, but it fires, you know, spine stacks and stuff. So uh, he was talking about how cool the unit idea was, and so he really wanted to see it. For whatever reason, he really liked it. So I was able to implement that. That's actually the first unit that got implemented. After that, I did the uh, Trebrothalor, and then I did the Acriminalisk last. Uh, because in terms of complexity of, like, the behavior, uh, that, was pro that was the order in which it was possible. I guess the Trebrothalor was probably pretty easy since it was just crushing tide, right? But um, I didn't know that at the time. It had a different set of uh, behaviors that I did not conceptually revise. Since uh, the Trebrothalor and the Acriminalisk both had multi-target in some way, I can't remember what the multi-target was for the Trebrothalor, but the Acriminalisk was supposed to be able to attack up to four targets. And multi-target is actually a Terran thing now. So we've removed it from like the Bargus and the Matrix for Protoss. And obviously we removed it conceptually from the Acriminalisk and replaced it with what it has now, which I think is just cooler anyway. So I don't think it was a loss, but you know, something to, to keep in mind. And so anyway, that kind of stuff is pretty cool. Uh, and I'm happy with how the units turned out, although I have yet to actually see them deployed in a game. The fact that they can be now is pretty cool. Uh, the main thing that we're really lacking for a lot of these later stage units actually is like birth animations because for these old graphics, right? Like, sure, I can make, uh, I can like hand paint or hand animate or whatever the, the, the build, the birth frames, they're not actually that complicated to animate or to do. Uh, it's, it's pretty easy actually to make it look reasonably, you know, baseline. The, the main concern I would have is that eventually we're going to replace these. And so it feels like wasted work. But when I think about it for longer than just a moment, it's actually pretty obvious that, you know, for some of these units in particular, since we're focusing a bit more on the tier two units, like tier one and tier two graphics for the replacements, particularly for Zerg, it's probably going to be a while before we get to these bad boys. So I should make note of which graphics need birth animations and plug them in, uh, like create them and plug them in. And so that will be an added focus. Actually, in general, I'll use this opportunity to quickly say, I've, you know, I was watching uh, Hapsea's stream recently. He was facing a, P a Protoss versus Protoss against Hamster. And it was very clear that he didn't understand how the Demiurge worked and that he didn't understand his units were going to be uh, dominated using the worship passive and stuff. And I was also watching like architect moves and stuff and how like it was really clearly obvious that something weird was going on with the architect and how uh, it was firing a shot, but it was charging. And if you, you only heard the audio, you needed a visual to match it. And then I remembered that what I did for the Acriminalesque when it fires Omnispores is I took the same graphic that the Anticathon and the Anthelion use for their attack animation. And I made it so that I colored it green. You remapped it to green instead. And then overlaid that when it would fire its passive attack. It's a secondary weapon. And so the, the significance of this anyway is that you know, it, it has a read for when it expends all of the, the spores. And I think that is nice. It matches, you know, it's, it's good. It could use a custom uh, audio cue because currently it, it just uses the same thing as the spear tith, I think, or the spray, one of the, one of those weapon fires. So it could definitely use its own love in the audio department, but visually, even though it's just a recolor of an existing effect, it's fine. And I thought to myself, why don't I just use that for the architect charge up? And I imgall that, like overlay that during the, the wind, up, wind up three times to match the sort of charge up sound effect and color it blue. And that's what I did, and it works. You know, it's pretty obvious what you're looking at. It's maybe a bit noisy. I might try the uh, medium size instead of the large size of that graphic since it came in three sizes. And I actually took the small size version of that graphic and used it for the artisan resource return charge up, 
culminating in a neutron flare overlay, which is the uh, land effect weapon hit, the Corsair weapon hit. And so uh, that's what it hap- that's what shows when it uh, pops. And so obviously in the neutron flare case, it should probably be a different graphic because then it, you, if there happens to be a land effect nearby, you know, then you might think that did it just get hit by something? It's a very different co- sound effect. So at least there's that for help. But it's something to indicate that it's different than the the overlay that was playing while it was actually channeling the, the charge up for the returning of the resource to indicate that it's procs. And so that's satisfying and nice and clean. And it just adds, even though it's just visuals and like sometimes audio is more important than visuals, it, it does add an element of cleanliness and I guess like perceived polish to have those kinds of visuals. And so, yeah, the birth animations are not really that big of a deal, although they can psychologically prepare you for something like the ultra core birth animation is used for the criminalist. And if you think it's ultra cores and then it's an criminalist, then that's really confusing uh, if you're like sieging a base or whatever. And so you might make like a snap decision thinking it's that. And so that could actually be very confusing and very obviously not ideal. Uh, so that that's one example for why on a functional level you should do it. But then just like in general, the sense of polish for the average spectator, they're not going to know why like it looks like one Zerg unit and then turns into another. They're not going to be familiar with the fact that the birth animations are like a different graphic that we load differently uh, in the dat setup and stuff like the data files point to it differently. And so like, they're not going to know the, the back end or like the reason why they're just going to see that it's missing. Just like they kind of look at these graphics and think maybe some of them are whack. Well, at least if they're consistent from birth to, to mutate to whatever else, that would be something. And so I think uh, going back to making those kinds of things is probably a good shout at this stage. Maybe doing some other minor, uh, audiovisual improvements, particularly visual improvements, since I do think that it's it's feasible to make things look better and, uh, you know, work better uh, for the reads. And so there's a couple of other details there. Like I was thinking maybe the uh, victims of the Zoryusthaleth might get the uh, green overlay that the criminalist uses, but sized appropriately to the source graphic and might have that be a debuff that indicates the swarming omen stuff because there's no read for that. Uh, there should definitely be reads for, I don't know what we can do for stacking reads. Things like actually the Demiurge worship should probably be a stack that increases in, in opacity or strength as the uh, as the worship time gets closer and closer and then remains at max until the worship, until like the unit is uh, no longer in the area, uh, like the Demiurge is no longer dominating it or whatever. So that would be one uh, good thing. I think that would be, that would be good to use anyway. Um, but beyond that, you know, there's other ideas. There's other things to think about. There's uh, madcap stacks, for example, that should definitely be a thing that, uh, that shows up. I'm trying to think if there's anything, there's probably a bunch of other behaviors and and stuff that I should somehow find a way to, to indicate, uh, the Gazithalor passive where the, the projectile gains damage while it travels is a pretty big deal. Like I was thinking a a while ago, it should probably get like hue shifted or or grow bigger or something, but you know, how are you going to, um, you know, graphically re- represent that. So there's like a challenge to, to design that visually. Um, yeah, I don't, there's, there's probably more things to, to do, but anyway, it's a good start to get the artisan the architect and the Demiurge stuff taken care of because for a very long time, they just haven't, uh, had that. And so, you know, maybe, uh, recoloring that orange one red and using it for the paladin, even though it would maybe be a little bit out of place, uh, the, the effect that I used for the Antikathon, right. But red might be kind of good for like the, that, I mean, it, it does look very strange compared to like, cause it's just a big Walker. So you wouldn't really associate it with that, but like something to indicate that like, Hey, it's locked on. Right. Uh, maybe I can just like quickly do up a, a red frame or, or some sort of hazard, fr- uh, animation or something in, in the, uh, blender output to, and just remodel or re-render it out or something. But that would be one thing to think about. So these minor things, minor things that we can do to improve the, uh, graphics and, uh, make the game more obviously like tell a more accurate story to what is going on so that players who are unfamiliar with certain behaviors and players who are just watching for the first time, see a more un- like they understand more what's going on. I think that would be a good move. So There you have it, some thoughts from yours truly about how to improve Cosmonarchy and obviously some excitement regarding the new additions in the Zerg tech tree, which again, you can see on your screen now. How you feel about seeing them on your screen and their current state is up to you. You know what else is up to you? Whether you're in March Invitational B, 
Did you sign up? Did you get good enough to get an invite in the first place? These are questions that were definitely yours to answer, but by the time you're listening to this, it's already too late. We have finalized the, certainly the map list, but definitely, uh, hopefully anyway, the player list. I'm working with Urbmon later tonight on the night of recording to set up his game, get him ready, and maybe get him practiced if he's down for that. Uh, definitely going to be interesting to see that through and figure out which group he's going to be seated into. And then we just have one more slot where there's a number of potential candidates that might fill that one more forthcoming. But by the time you're listening to this, with any luck, I have completed my work as the representative of uh, Cosmonarchy and the No Frauds Club in sourcing additional players to join us. Uh, I'm very interested and excited about that, and I do think that we're going to have some pretty cool games pretty much no matter what. Obviously, uh, I have been uh, working a lot lately, but I have a week off starting the, today, the day of recording, which is Wednesday the 13th. And so I'll be using this time to grind out more progress, improving stability, improving visibility, you know, audiovisuals, uh, stuff like that, presentability, maybe you could call it, uh, for Cosmonarchy ahead of the uh, this second Invitational Tournament that we're running. And I'll also be evaluating more games, doing more castovers. I did two earlier today that were pretty interesting, uh, including a, a debut for, of a new player, The Night Fox. And you know, I say this with all due respect to The Night Fox and other new players like Jackie Lansky who have popped in and have started playing pretty frequently. I look forward to when it's actually popping off that I can't necessarily point to the people who are new anymore that are like, oh wait, you know, there's like 10 new people or whatever every week. Like that's the that's the realm we want to get into where the player base is really growing. And uh, you know, Hapseo once said to me that if we get like 50 or 100 players, something like that, which is pretty reasonable to try to do. We're at like maybe 20 in terms of the, the regular actives and sometimes it spikes up to 30. If we can get up to 50 and then up to 100, I think it'll just pop off from there, dude. It's going to be so much uh, easier to, to find people to play games. Like I see, I see a lot of games that get played, but don't get me wrong. I also happen to see Nablime pinging Fraud Monarch looking for people, Newt pinging Fraud Monarch, Hapsaya himself pinging Fraud Monarch sometimes. And it's like, no, when that narrative changes, when we get more people who immediately answer the call, who are pinging themselves looking for games and, and they don't get left hanging and people are there and they, maybe they don't even have to ping because they're already hooked up on the Radmin and they're already joined and they're already, you know, looking uh, through the games list and looking for players to play with and stuff. Like when we get to that territory, that's when we're really cooking. And so I'm looking forward to that because there'll be no trouble at all filling out these invitationals that are meant to be higher skill with higher stakes games. But despite that, we have prize pools. We've got $225 redues, smackaroos for this tournament. That means first place in each group, 37 bucks. That's the Mets and Diablo 3 number. Holy shit. Then second place, 14 bucks. And third place, five bucks. That's what we got right now going. I'm looking forward to seeing how people react to whatever amount of money they earn. Uh, and it's really cool. I mean, certain people said that uh, they would, people have already told me, some of them have already told me that they're just going to reinvest it back into development. So I'm over here secretly polling like, oh yeah, that guy should win. So I get the money, <laughs> but obviously it's pretty cool. I mean, Newt won his group, right? And you know, uh, there's a, there's a number of other people who won their group in uh, group or no, uh, March Invitational A, and they have since qualified over to Invitational B. So it's worth noting, I'll pull up the uh, confirmed list of participants and tell you guys a little bit about what, what we are talking about here. So for me, like for my money, I look at group A, the aquarium. This is already confirmed to have Newt, Three Crow, and Art of Turtle. I guess technically Newt might fluctuate because he has full availability for that day, but pretty sure he's going to be in group A for that. So uh, that's going to be an exciting one because he's going to be going up against Three Crow, who's a very cheesy Protoss player who has a pretty deep tech tree knowledge and Newt does struggle the longer the game goes on. So if Three Crow holds on long enough and doesn't just die, he could actually mount a pretty successful defense. Meanwhile, Art of Turtle, totally new, but very, very solid Zerg player from Brood War. He's going to come in as Zerg this time around. He has pretty much no practice. I don't even know if he's got the game set up or not. I think he's probably going to spike up in the last couple of days before the event, or maybe just one day before the event or something, <laughs> the morning of perhaps, who knows? Uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens there. I mean, maybe he just ends up four pooling or six pooling as it is in Cosmonarchy every game, who knows? But he did tell me that he was down and he was interested and he definitely wanted to get some games in. So we'll see how that plays out. Maybe he'll play a little bit more because he's also organizing lands and stuff. He's a busy guy, he works. So, you know, maybe he'll play a little bit more later on. He might even try, depending on his experience here, to qualify for the Acropolis event that we got coming up. Uh, Meanwhile, Group B, Crow Founders, that's got Hamster and Veek in it, and that's where we're not sure who's going to fill out that group. 
On Group C's side, uh, oh, by the way, Hamster and Veek are Protoss and Zerg, respectively. They actually swapped races compared to Ascension number seven, if you're keeping track of that. Group C, Germani, that's Neblime's Zerg, Benno's Protoss, and Erbmon's Zerg. Assuming his availability holds for that group, we might swap him into Group B, we'll see. But that's a pretty funny group name, and, you know, maybe it'll change. Uh, obviously, Neblime being Zerg still, despite him being very enamored with the ideas that are present in Terran. And I did say earlier today that uh, I'll probably end up increasing the movement speed of Haraka slightly, which of course technically means I'm buffing Ahmed, which of course means Neblime will return to Terran. So that's pretty funny. Uh, but uh, many, meanwhile, Benno impressed a lot of people with his Protoss. He qualified to this event by defeating Sipiak in a best of five. It was a three to one scoreline. Three Crow qualified to this event, beating Biddy B in a mirror matchup, Protoss versus Protoss. And that was a three to one victory for him as well. Meanwhile, we had uh, Newt just receive an invite because of his performance in the previous tournament. Uh, Jack Jackie was going to duke it out against Lundier, but Lundier was not able to make it. And so Jack got the invite and he will be in group D as the Zerg, Hapsea's Protoss and the Shambler's Terran round that one out. So I'm looking forward to these already. And we don't even know who our final contestant is just yet. Uh, we might decide to extend the invite to one of the newcomers. We might decide to look for another high skill player. A lot of it depends on who gets back to me actually, because I've already sent out a couple of potentials, but it's very, very cool to see certain details here. And I personally am very much looking forward to how this stuff shakes out. And I hope you guys were looking forward to the viewer questions, the coffee questions, in fact. We're going to be taking questions from our financial backers, our donators, our homies who have provided funds for further development. Let's start off with the homie himself, Mirian. He asks uh, uh, some interesting questions here. He says, what fruits and vegetables are you most fond of? Or how would you go about creating a non-parasitic plant or mycelium-based species in any of your settings? Well, uh, I would say for fruits and vegetables, I go for bananas because they mix very, very well with peanut butter. I know b uh, apples do as well, but bananas mix well with peanut butter. They mix well with yogurt. They mix well with all sorts of stuff. I feel like they're, they're very versatile as, as a ingredients and other things. Uh, I'm never going to have them by themselves. Uh, I mean, I can, but it's just not my favorite thing. Uh, but as an ingredient, great. And on the topic of vegetables, I am uh, recently turned into a kale man. I always loved broccoli as well. Uh, so, you know, those are two for you. Uh, I'm trying kale mostly because uh, it seems like they're like a, it's a pretty good shout for, you know, correcting vitamin deficiencies and such. Uh, although I am eating it raw. So there's a asterisk next to that. We'll see how that shakes up. That's something I started uh, taking a lot more seriously, like one at least one giant cup of it a day uh, for the last week. So, uh, you know, some more stuff may come from that. But I do enjoy the fact that it makes my tongue bright green. That's at least interesting. But the second question here is about uh, non-parasitic plant or mycelium-based species. Um, I think you you kind of already have an answer to this because um, whether or not it's plant or mycelium-based, it's the same kind of idea of a network of um, like communications, and that is the uh, Orlothrae in Zabalba. Uh, there's also you know like a similar mechanic for it. Um, with the uh, Gatamemter. With Gatamemter, it's a super consciousness and how it's being biologically replicated is not exactly edified anywhere, but the idea behind it uh, is kind of similar to how the mycelium networks are proposed to work. So I would just look at the Orlothrae. I would say, hey, the, those are a pretty good example. Uh, I mean, you said non-parasitic. I don't know that you can call the Orlothrae parasitic per se. Um, obviously they can take over uh, other life forms. So like the question would really turn into like, is there, do you have an example of a non-parasitic mycelium? Because that would essentially be what you'd be have to make. And I think that pretty much all of the fungus, all of the, uh, the, the, the different mushrooms and stuff. I don't know if you, where, where did you draw the line on parasite? Because they obviously feed off of, you know, dead and dying, uh, decaying trees and stuff and, and other rotting aspects. So like from from my standpoint, I don't really know if it's the same thing, uh, but that would be something to think about. Um, as far as like if I was going to make a new one, though, I'd probably go for something like maybe a fifth faction within uh, or, or fifth race, if you want to use that term instead for um, Onatar. Uh, I, I guess in, in some ways the voiceless are kind of like um, 
instead of them being parasitic, they're more like twisted. Uh, and so you might just look specifically at the voiceless for that, although they're not exactly plant. Uh, I almost said plant based. I mean, technically that is in keeping with the wording of the question, but uh, yeah, that makes me think of, you know, vegan cheese or whatever. Um, yeah, as a, as a, a plant faction or, or mycelium faction, uh, I would say check out the voiceless as well. Uh, they are definitely uh, a faction that is worth uh, taking a look at for that. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the, the hallmarks of them tend to be that they, um, they, they spread by taking over the territory, the, the biome, the environment, uh, but they don't necessarily have like mind controlling slash parasitic um, gameplay tendencies. That just happens to be how they spread their influence in terms of the environment. So you'll see the environment change with uh, the voiceless. And Onatar is about environmental changes in some ways. So something to keep in mind as well. Uh, so yeah, I guess in some ways I've, I've given you examples of stuff that I've already made, but hopefully it underscores the kinds of things that I'm looking for is like, you know, stuff that's a little bit more reliant on the environment if they're not going to be parasitic. And I, I also don't exactly know where you draw the line on, on what's a parasite, what isn't, but there you have it. There's some answers to your questions, sir. Moving on to the shambler, uh, we have from him an interesting question here. He says, has humanity transcended tribe and racial loyalties in cosmonarchy, remained the same, or have they expanded in scope with the size of the setting? And he gives an example where all people from World X have been ethnically homogenized due to the increase in the scale of social interaction, and by extension, mis miscegenation. I don't, I don't even know that word, so I'd have to look that one up. Uh, in addition to the negation of mutation inducing environmental stimuli via tech, to the point that only individuals from an entirely different planet can really be said to have significant genetic differences from them. Uh, so the short answer is that a lot of the Terran worlds import talent and uh, all other things. There's a lot of you know, pilgrims, if you want to use that term, there's a lot of um, people going on, you know, journeys to see if they can, you know, make a quick buck, you know, a lot of, it, think more Star Wars in terms of, you know, there being a lot of sort of banditry and, uh, and, and skullduggery, uh, but also a lot of like people who are just looking to see if they can uh, have a career being more like, uh, you know, space desperados or something like that. So more Wild West for a lot of that stuff. Obviously, there are organized militaries, but there's also a whole host of stuff, particularly in Terran-controlled space where there isn't really much of a contest with the other races. There's a lot of uh, Terran stuff that is a lot more like, oh, let's just be a diaspora. So I wouldn't say that they've, like, tra in the context of, like, uh, racial loyalties, tribal, tribal loyalties, um, I'm not going to say it's completely gone, uh, but it's definitely not at the forefront of the issues when you're dealing with, like, I, I would think about it like what would happen in, in to modern man if we had an alien uh, invader or hostile force. Uh, we'd probably all rally under the banner of humans, at least most of us would. And so that's sort of how I think of it is. I don't think it's like a, a one note thing where it's completely gone. But they're probably not going to care what your skin color is as long as they know that you're actually a human. Uh, they'd be a lot more distrusting and, I guess, um, discriminatory towards members of other races or maybe like Nidus Trinity converts or whatever. So these are some examples of the things that matter a little bit more as far as the dividing lines. Uh, tribalness, maybe in terms of the nation that you swear uh, you know, allegiance towards uh, or maybe in terms of, you know what your purpose might be if you're you know somebody if you're, if you're in the golden republic or something like that that might be a thing that that comes up but you know uh for the most part it's like factional or whatever and then uh that, that's probably the extent of it so there's an answer to your question shambler and thanks for the vocab word Jesse asks, uh, by the way, Jesse is a new donor. Congratulations and welcome. Uh, I don't know why I'm saying congratulations. Congratulations on beating the Terran tutorial, but also welcome and thank you, sir, for your patronage. Uh, Jesse's first question, inaugural appearance in an episode of Prototype is, in the last Prototype, number 40, <coughs> excuse me, number 47, you spoke about single player RTS campaigns not reflecting real RTS gameplay and not really preparing the player for melee type play. The tutorial is a good example of single player content where you actually have to play the RTS or play RTS against the opponent on equal footing. However, many campaign stories feature intrinsically uneven starting conditions for the combatants. For instance, rebelling against a more powerful controlling faction, breaking into an entrenched location, or staging a smash and grab versus a more powerful foe. How do you balance the desire for more melee-esque slash real RTS play with the needs of the story in this regard? 
And so actually it's really interesting because uh, this question was asked before my conversation with the Electric Underground, which definitely spoke a lot to this particular topic of balancing gameplay versus story and how the story in it maybe it maybe you should start to think about your gameplay's story and premise in the context of plot and setting as opposed to worrying about the narrative because then it's more like okay what is the what are the what is the scenario here that leads to an interesting gameplay experience and how can i then you know work from that starting point into like basically working from the gameplay's perspective to make the story work instead of from you know working on the uh, on the story first and then trying to backdoor the gameplay into that where you end up getting into this weird territory. Uh, and also on previous episodes, I think maybe it was forty six or forty five or something. Uh, I'll I'll grab a link and leave it in the description for Jesse to check out and anybody else who's interested. Uh, the uh, I did leave an answer to a similar question by Chum Beck, who asked about how I would have a, a, a design of, a, of an RTS uh, mission where you were taking charge of attacking a citadel or fortress, and how that's obviously going to involve more than just even footing, equal footing. Uh, so that's a more particularly pointed example of this sort of thing, but my broad answer would be that... The way that you balance RTS play, that the desire for more real RTS play is is for one to say, it actually doesn't have to be melee per se. It doesn't have to be that you start with six workers and a town center. I took that convention from the tutorial so that people could immediately jump into multiplayer if they wanted to. But I think that like, for example, if we were gonna go for, if we were gonna stick with tutorials, we were gonna make like a second episode of the Terran tutorial that like follows the same characters, but uh, now you're actually leading like a real uh, military operation or something, or maybe you're in for like some sort of advanced training simulation or something. And that's like the optional stuff, right? Um, th that could be kind of interesting because then maybe you take a Terran training sequence against Protoss and then against Zerg. And then you could like sort of figure out that matchup in that way. And then in that case, we would want even footing, you know, melee start. Uh, and then, you know, we, we use the, the actual campaigns themselves to sort of meditate on that idea. And so in To Touch the Sun and other campaign content that I'm working on, uh, you actually often don't start with only six workers in the town center. You start with maybe a stockade in the Terran example, a watchdog, and a couple of infantry units, as well as maybe eight workers instead of six or something like that. Uh, generally speaking, I like the idea of imagining how what, you know, what your economy would look like and what your... Um, what your re base, you know, resource count would look like at the start. Like if you, how much money will you have in the bank if you started at six workers and then built up from there. But I always usually cut the worker count a little bit because otherwise you'd, uh, you'd skip past most of the uh, early stages of the gameplay there. Uh, so anyway, I think it's fine to keep sort of migrate over that convention of, you know, at least in some contexts, uh, having, you know, different non-standard non-melee starting conditions. Uh, especially since you're probably going to be, as uh, Jesse's question and Chumbeck before uh, mentioned that like, hey, look at this stuff. It's uh, going to be different. You know, you're talking about sieging a, a, a palace or something like you, you obviously need to have some sort of uh, pre-existing force there, you would think. And so I don't know how else you could you could tell that kind of story fittingly. Well, the, the solution is to make it so that it's fair. Uh, so that the evenness comes not from having identical circumstances because maybe the maps aren't symmetrical and all this other stuff, but instead by having, you know, a relatively equivalent amount of risk and assets. And so if you are facing off against a player who has a whole fortress and they're trying to defend it from you, then they should also be facing off against like three or four other players at the same time. And maybe it's an FFA or maybe it's a team game where you're trying to surround and destroy this, you know, bring down this force. And maybe you have some of your allies that have been deployed with a minimal amount of initial units. And they are only really exist for that purpose of sort of buttressing and, and, you know, thinning the herd of the, of the palace guards or something in this, in this example that we're thinking about. And so uh, there's definitely some cases where you'll have stuff like that. I think I'm mostly interested in how people like Jesse, people like Chumbeck, uh, think about the solutions that I bring to the table when I release content for things like Day of Blood or uh, To Touch the Sun late for the later missions where it's it's a little bit more scaled up uh, and stuff like that. Because when you when you actually play through what I imagine will be the sort of de facto like best option, best practice for this sort of thing, uh, I think it'll be pretty clear. Um, that being said, obviously the tutorial is still in progress itself and. Uh, it's worth noting that the, you know, the gameplay direction probably won't change, but a lot of the dialogue will. And so that's another thing that will be very different than Melee is you won't really have the dialogue parts, right? And so um, 
I mean, I, I said this at some point. Uh, I can't remember if this made it into the Say and KCM uh, conversation, uh, but uh, I did talk with him about how, like, you know, I, by playing multiplayer, like, Melee games, I've actually had story ideas. Like, you could come up with a story that fits that Melee game. And that's sort of what I would imagine is, like, I already have my characters and stuff, but what kind of gameplay experiences do I want to have? And how can I frame the narrative, the the story uh, around that while still making sense with the characters that I've created so it doesn't feel out of character or out of scope? Uh, that feels like a little bit more vague than I wanted it to be as far as the answer goes, but uh, there are more specific examples left in, uh, like like I said, there's going to be a link uh, in the description underneath this question by the timestamps. You can check that out for uh, the answer to Chumbeck's question from earlier in the podcast's history. And yeah, uh, I do think it's a, it's a worthy topic and I'm really looking forward to being able to explore quality answers to it in terms of actual products and not just, you know, podcast answers, although hopefully you still appreciated it as well. Thank you again for your support. And we'll move on to Three Crows question who asks, how would you go about designing an RTS that only took place in space with the only units available being different spacecraft? You can still have planets, space stations, and other celestial features, but can only interact with them using unit behaviors or game features. Well, game features is very vague, but I would say this is, in some ways, it's like asking me to design a better version of Five Nations, which I think I, I'm three quarters familiar with. I don't know how much of the streams he watched because uh, I have streamed a lot of that game. I think maybe 10 or so times I uh, booted up the stream for that. And um, I mean, in terms of designing it from a game theoretic, like game design standpoint, I would definitely, if I'm going to go for space, right? Like the biggest problem with space RTS games is that like there used to be these things called fleet mods back in the day for Brood War. Mesk actually made a bunch of them himself, Eskatu Mesk. And the way that I would look at the fleet mod idea is I would look at it and say, it's kind of an interesting concept. The problem is there's no ground units and so there's no terrain significance. Um, now, if the terrain still dictates where you can place structures, then maybe that can be interesting for funneling units down a certain path. And I would probably also have the ability to isolate maybe like certain pathways or speedways or something like that, that can kind of like rocket air units out. And so there'd be different obstacles. There would still be pathfinding. There would still be like terrain that blocks your ability to fly into stuff, maybe dense asteroid fields or whatever. Um, I don't know if I would go the 3D route, but it's a little bit awkward to me that Five Nations is a game set in space, but it has like walls that you can't traverse underneath because space apparently isn't three dimensional. That's a little weird, but maybe I would just say fuck it and, and keep that because from a gameplay standpoint, it's way better and just hope that like by never drawing attention to it, it's something that we uh, are fine with. And maybe I could come up with some sort of slightly ham-fisted reasoning for, you know, like these particular matter fields that have been constructed as like maybe part of the arms race is creating these sorts of things that you can create uh, th there would be some pre-placed on the map for the layouts, but maybe you can build them as part of your constructions and they can actually provide you with all sorts of interesting things. Like maybe that is interference for the scrambling of the, the nav, nav machines and stuff or whatever. And, and, you know, you'd probably want organics in there too. So how do you uh, explain how it works for both? But you know, whatever, uh, interference fields that would cause you to just crash. And so functionally they act as path blockers because your units, we should never just blow up or whatever from walking into a, uh, a terrain object. Uh, but that would be like, maybe you can come up with a genuine example in lore to narratively justify why we have essentially walls or, or terrain or whatever in uh, what is supposed to be a three dimensional space. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I think <clears throat> maybe it's something like that. Um, definitely could be interesting. I think that, uh, what I'm most interested in with this kind of thought experiment with designing a space RTS would definitely be like, still make terrain matter. Uh, if terrain is also where you add structures, like structures can't be built just anywhere in open space or whatever, or maybe some of them can, but many of them can't. Like maybe all your your harvesting facilities need to be as attached to particular resource nodes and, and terrain objects. And maybe all of your infrastructure needs to be attached to the uh, like your your production structures, I should say, need to be attached to the the main like town center or stuff, uh, like uh, actual terrain objects or whatever that have been created there. And then maybe you can create additional pavilions, platforms uh, for the purposes of adding more structures, right? Uh, so like if you wanted to expand your build space, that would require you to do your own set of work um, 
with in terms of the infrastructure. And I think that could be really interesting and cool because it would be about scaling up and literally giving yourself like more build space in order to do stuff in. So I would think about doing it that way. I definitely think about having, you know, you know, one thing that you have to say Five Nations is pretty cool for is the fact that it has five factions and apparently the DLC adds a sixth one, although I haven't actually seen it and I don't know if I'll be streaming it anymore, but uh, definitely something worth pointing out is that the there is a sixth faction in the campaign or whatever. And so like, Having more many playable factions is always ideal for me. Obviously, we want to add a fourth race to Cause Monarchy this year, so that's like another thing that we're working on. And so, yeah, there's loads of stuff there that I would say are, are worth pointing out. But um, I do think that I would work in terrain. I would make uh, terrain really matter for sure for pathing and for uh, construction. And I would then also make it so that you can change the pathways yourself. You can adjust it. You can break them down. You can, you know, so even though it's in space, terrain would matter maybe more than in the average RTS game uh, because it controls build space and um, like, well, terrain normally controls build space, pathing, vision, uh, and maybe some other details like cliff advantage or whatever, uh, as well as like locations where resources are. It would do all of that and and maybe even more like, you know, movement speed bo boosts or aura effects or whatever uh, from neutral map objects. But you would also be able to control like actually changing and deforming the terrain yourself by, you know, dismantling walls that block your paths with like higher tier units and uh, creating new ones uh, with maybe the same tier of unit or something that's higher or lower, depending on your race or whatever. So that would definitely be a big deal. Um because I think really that what's lacking in any fleet mod or any space RTS that I've seen, admittedly I haven't played too many of them, uh, but it just feels very aimless and formless when there's no significance to terrain. And Five Nations technically does have pathing blockers and stuff, although they don't have any height levels or anything like that, uh, but they still kind of minimize the impact of terrain in most of the cases, unless it's in their jank uh, campaign missions where the pathing half the time doesn't feel like it works properly and stuff. Um, and so anyway, adding significance back into that feels like a good idea. So thanks for your question, Three Crow, and hopefully you enjoyed the answer. Our last question comes from Alexander, who says, At what point, if any, would you consider Cosmonarchy complete? At what point, if any, would you consider it a success? Now? At a certain audience slash player base? Why? Well, this is a very important question, and it's definitely a question that has been on my mind many times during Cosmonarchy's seven-plus year development now. Uh, and so looking at it for 2024, what is the goal? What is the the end state? Um, I think there's some people. Uh, I think when Mesk was still uh, involved in the community, he was definitely somebody who felt this way, that you, you probably would only consider the project complete when all the graphics are in and, uh, you know, all of the units have been added and stress tested and there's campaigns for all the races and multiple of them probably. And basically that's like the completionist, like 100%, we, we finished everything. I don't actually think that we will get there uh, because obviously in 2024 is meant to be the last primary year. Like, I guess to, to pull the curtain back a little bit further, what I mean by that is in 2025 and beyond, there's a good chance I'll still be working on occasional content, service state stuff like updating and very minor balance updates and stuff, maybe running events and such. But we'll, you know, Vik and myself will in theory be focused very heavily around working on uh, building a new RTS game. And so that will involve engine work, that will involve design work, that will involve uh, obviously voice work and narrative design and, and forks, and uh, also creating a lot of campaigns uh, and content in general and testing, right? And so as that heats up, uh, there would be less time to spend on Cosmonarchy, but Cosmonarchy would still have some time spent on it to create additional campaigns, which is really what I always wanted to do when I was a wee lad. Uh, and I've since decided to think about re-examining and reinventing the whole genre as a result. It's quite the journey in some ways. Uh, so would I consider Cosmonarchy complete or, or what point would I consider it complete? I think it's complete when it has confirmed, served its purpose as a prototype of our new uh, and like our new RTS genre sort of push our new thoughts behind the RTS. I think it's, um, it, it, I can consider it complete when we have our own, you know, other RTS game well in development and, you know, looking good and feeling good. And we can, um, you know, think about it as that in, in some ways, even without starting our next big RTS that we're like really focused on Cosmonarchy is already kind of complete in that respect because it served its purpose as a prototype. Uh, at the same time, I would I would probably not want to consider it complete until the fourth race is in, the campaign, at least a couple of campaigns are done. Uh, some of the stuff that's on the roadmap right now, if you go to the Cosmonarchy Brood War website, uh, or just Cosmonarchy website, uh, you can go to, uh, you can also try cmbw.club. That's a, a, another one that uh, Veek made. Uh, and so uh, I think the redirect is a little slow there, but 
fraudsclub.com slash CMBW. Uh, there's a roadmap section and you can check that and enjoy it and, and read what we plan. And that is indeed what we're going for. So it's like, you know, two to three Acropolises this year, um, you know, two to three campaigns this year, uh, obviously the fraud launcher itself getting a 2.0 version out there and uh, otherwise, yeah, just adding more and more uh, work. So, uh, you know, getting more more stuff out there. But I think at this point, it's mostly like content. And, you know, I would consider the fourth race content, even though it's also core. Um, you know, it's definitely still very, it's going to be a big event when it finally ships. And when it gets to the point where it's even available for testing and stuff, that's going to be really cool. So, um, yeah. And then what do I consider it's a success? Maybe that's the better answer. So the, the answer to complete is, you know, the end of this year, hopefully we get all that stuff done. The, um, is it a success? Yeah, it's already been a success. Uh, I think the success is really the success story is that we've convinced ourselves and many other people in this community uh, that we've got something special here and that we know something uh, we know a thing or two about what the RTS should be. And that is how we come to this situation and, and maybe hopefully uh, create a new generation of RTS players and also games. So uh, yeah, I'd say it's been a success already. And that does it for our show, ladies and gentlemen the end of this episode of Prototype, episode 48. Zerg are here. We've got a lot of Zergs in this forthcoming tournament. I look forward to catching you guys for that event on the uh, Saturday the 16th very soon, very soon. Uh, otherwise, just enjoy the daily castovers. Enjoy the uh, interviews that are being, or I guess conversations as they are now, uh, Clubhouse Conversations over in the No Frauds Club channel. we got more of those coming. And otherwise, uh, stay tuned for more stuff. Stay tuned for more uh, smashing of a different different variety when I'm streaming all of the stuff that I'm doing and really uh, jamming out to the fact that we've got all this really cool stuff that I'm very happy with. Until next time, boys. G G.